Well, hey there, David. Graham, you're alive. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Uh, I, I am alive, but I'm not feeling very well. Oh, um, you see, oh, I'm sorry. I ate a whole clock today. Why did you do that? I don't know, but it was rather time consuming. Oh, 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 it's joke time. You're doing a joke. Oh, uh, what do we do here? We rain out of the... Um, it's a good joke. 4.75. Okay. 4.75 out of 10. Cool. Okay. You got okay. one for me? Yeah, I'm, uh, let's try this one. I, I mean, I've only been working on this one since the last season. Oh, dear. Why do cowboys always ride horses? Um, has it's long ways to walk in the West. Why? Well, a uh, horse is too heavy to carry. <laughs> uh, that's very funny is it funnier than mine probably let's give it a five. Oh, thank you you know i think this is the best rated jokes that we've ever done to start a season probably so it, we're either feeling magnanimous towards one another or like excited to be here for another season yeah. or the jokes are actually that good they're not oh well either way enough of the nonsense let's get on with the nonsense <laughs> Welcome back to Witty Windle, a whimsical interactive show for kids who love stories, words, and grown-worthy jokes, and featuring your favorite authors and illustrators. It's part book club, part game show. It's your weekly adventure through the wild world of wordplay, and we are back for a fourth season, Graham Pittman. No, wait. That's Graham Pittman. I'm David Kern. <laughs> Either way, we're back for a new season. How are you, Graham? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well, too. Well, that's a very polite way of saying, you know, most people be like, good. Well, um, I'm, I'm feeling a little reserved because I've got a little bit of, I'm just going to say it, I, I'm a little bit angry. You're, I'm oh, a little bit angry at, at you, David. What? Uh, yeah. I, I, I was I, do? I was trying to put it put it past me, you know, trying to move on, but I, I'm just angry. Uh, that's it. You're not gonna tell me why. Well, you know why. Uh, okay. What did we do this summer? We. What did we do in the off season? We we did go. We went hiking. We did go hiking. Where did we go hiking to? A mountain. We climbed a mountain. Is that what you're upset about? Why did we climb the mountain? We climbed the mountain. Because you told me that there was a golden pigeon hidden somewhere near the summit. And I looked for that pigeon for days. You left after a few hours. And I was up there. I had to camp out. I started my own well, fires. I left because I, to, I saw it. I cooked my own leaves. No golden pigeon. You cooked leaves? There was like trees up there. Yeah, and I had trail mix with me. But I, the, the leaves were there. I cooked them. I ate them. My legs were burning. Well, Grim, mm. I found the golden pigeon when we got up there. Remember when I said, hey, Graham, look. Oh, yeah. Well, then I took the golden pigeon. Uh-huh. I was delirious I with uh, fatigue, exhaustion. Yeah. Yes. And Ugh. I, being hungry, Yeah. I, I ate it. Well, I think you were supposed to. Which explains why you couldn't find it. Yeah, but then did you, did you get the wishes? Yeah. Okay, and you wish for season four? I wish for season four with you, Wendell. What oh, do you think I am, a, a fool? Thank goodness. Okay, so that explains all, yeah. why we're here. <laughs> I'm, why not, we're all right. here. I'm not as we angry. We climbed to the top of the mountain. Yeah. I found the golden pigeon. You hung out for a while, and here we are. Hung out. Yes. Okay, so David and I really did climb a mountain. We did, In yes. North Carolina, and it was a harrowing experience. It did not last days, <laughs> though. It did not. It wasn't that harrowing, but it, it was lasted a great view. a long it time. Was, it was, they, it was it, on, the, on the strenuous scale... It ranked as strenuous. <laughs> yes, from zero to strenuous, it was strenuous. Well, uh, speaking of things that are not strenuous, we are very excited about being here for season four of Withy Wendell. We have some new things that we're going to be doing this season. As usual, we are going to have snack time. We're going to have a lazy word segment. Graham's mm. back with more lazy words. We're going to have interviews with wonderful authors, and we're going to end every episode with a riddle. But we have a change. We have a change, Graham. We're trying something new. We're trying something new. It's good to try new things, like instead climbing of, mountains. Instead of book time, Graham, yes. we're going to have story time. Yes. Each week, one of us is going to surprise the other with a story. Now, mm -hmm. not just any story. Not like a story we've written no, 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 ourselves. Not, not no. like a story about how we climbed a mountain and found a golden pigeon. Yeah. A good story. Like a good story, yeah. A classic, yeah. a story that's you know been passed down in some way. A folk tale, a fable, mm. a myth, something like that. Yeah. And... The person who brings it is going to surprise the other person, and we're going to read it out loud, and we're going to experience that story together. Yeah, like like, like one like I won't know what you're about to read, 
and neither does the audience. And you'll we're be surprised. All, we're all in it together. Yeah, exactly. So we're very excited about that. That way, those of you who were not able to keep up with the books can still listen to the episodes and not get lost. And also, it just gives us a chance to try some new things and you a chance to hear some great new stories. Um, anything else that we think we should tell the kids about uh, the new season? Well, we have a great lineup. This season, we are very excited. Um, we have Alyssa Coleman coming up. We have mm-hmm. Johnny Jimison coming up, Alan Gratz. And then this episode, as people know, because they clicked on it and they saw it in the title. That's right. Gary Schmidt is joining us. We yeah. could not be more excited about this. Yeah, Gary is someone who we've had um, on our wish list for a long time. I was going to say, we've had our eye on him for a while, but we've that sounds a little bit him. more like creepy. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have had him on our wish list for and a we, long time. And, and, we, and we kept uh, asking him to come on. He kept saying no. And then you <laughs> rubbed your belly after you ate the golden pigeon. Well, that was my second wish, yeah. And yeah, he's like, sure, I'll come on. Yeah. So, my third wish was more golden pigeons so far. That hasn't come true. Hasn't Maybe come true reserve yet, your third wish until we find the perfect scenario for you to use it. Oh, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Mm. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of great guests coming up. We are very excited about that. Um, but before we go move on to anything, just uh, this is an interactive show. Um, we, we love it when you guys, uh, send us email, you know, with the riddle answers or requesting an author. And right now I'm going to ask listeners for our first request of the season. I want to see some drawings of David either eating the golden pigeon, (laughs) finding the golden pigeon, uh, rubbing his belly to get his wish, you know, anything, uh, or alternatively we can have pictures of Graham being exhausted on top of a mountain. Alone, lonely, <laughs> burning scared. leaves. So not next to not a fire burning, per se. He's cooking them in a, in the pot. So I eating, the pot. eating smoke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we really did climb a mountain. So let's say that they... <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that the kids do what you are asking here. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How should they send us those pictures? Oh, correct. Yeah. So they are going to write us in at podcasts, podcasts at goldberrybooks.com. That's right. All right, Graham. Mm. We're going to come back in a second with snack time. Oh, but yum. first, break time. <laughs> All right, Graham, we are back with one of those segments that we've wondered if we should do away with. We wondered if people care. Do people really want to hear us talk about snacks? Turns out right. they do. People are very enthusiastic about, about us eating snacks. How do you know that people are enthusiastic? Because they have told me. Okay. They come into the bookstore and I say, hey, do you think we should get rid of snack time? And they say, well, you'll die. Oh. Because we won't eat then. But Oh, yeah. Okay. No, this is our no. only meal of the day? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Mm. Then they say... Well, I've got plenty of leaves. Snacks. They, they're just very encouraging about snacks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, he filled his backpack with leaves, brought him down to the mountain, and then forgot about him. So, uh, we're back with snack time. Now, we also want to tell you about some friends of ours, because, Graham, there's a new series of books out from Moody Publishers, and this series is called The Tree Street Kids. And you may be wondering... Why is David talking about the Tree Street Kids during snack time? Is it because the books are made out of like beef jerky? No. Okay. They're made of book material. Oh, paper. But they sent us a box of snacks. A what? They did, yes. They sent us a mystery box here that we're going to open in a second. Ooh. The Tree Street Kids books are about some kids who live on cherry, oak, maple, and pine but their 1990s suburban neighborhood is more than just quiet, tree-lined streets. Jack, Ellison, Roger, Ruthie, and Midge face challenges and find adventures in every creek and cul-de-sac, as well as God's great love in one small neighborhood. So the author of these books is Amanda Cleary Estep. She is a children's book author. This is her middle grade series, and... She says uh, when she is forced to act like an adult, she edits nonfiction books by grown-up authors. So she's either writing books or she's editing books. So she Mm -hmm. is is a big book person. She's bookish. Now, this also ties into our mountains thing because she uh, lives in the mountains of North Carolina. So there is a we uh, climb small but not zero percent chance that we bumped into her on that mountain, or we climbed her mountain. I never thought of that. Mm Hmm. We'll have to get with her and, and see what we'll clarify this. So there's two new books in this series that Amanda wrote. One is called Lions to the Rescue. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is called Mystery in Crooked Creek Woods. So these are good. These are good titles. Lions to the Rescue is about how uh, after starting fifth grade at a new school, it's, it's rougher than peewee football is. Um, but Jack 
uh, can join the Lions and help Ellison build the most epic bookmobile bike ever. That sounds that's awesome. One the, that's one of the goals. So then Jack devises the perfect game plan until he fumbles it with the most epic fail ever and a game day disaster. So that's one book. Then book four in the series is called, as I said, Mystery in Crooked Creek Woods. Something fishy is going on in Crooked Creek Woods. Does it have anything to do with the weird lights coming from Ruthie neighbor yard, Graham? It might. Or are the kids' imaginations just running away from them? Hmm. From them? With them. After all, Jack and Ellison have been hard at work writing their own mystery story. The Tree Street kids decide to investigate, as any good detective would. Of course. Not only do they discover what's been hidden for centuries in the woods, they also learn about placing their trust in the adults who love and care for them. But not before placing themselves in just a little bit of peril. So there's two new books from those. If you want to learn more about this series, head over to treestreetkids.com. Yeah, those sound amazing. So not only did they send us this information on this great book series and help us make sure that this season could happen, they this also sent us a box. A mystery now, box. We're going to open the mystery box. Mystery books. The mm. author of a mystery book sent us a mystery box, which yes. makes me a little bit anxious about what could possibly be inside of here. So why don't I let you oh dear. open it? It's full, I'm sure so it's full go. of leaves. Okay, well, you know what? Let's do it at the same time. Okay. You take that side. I'll take this side. All right. Here let's... we go. All right. Yep, there's definitely snacks. Oh, I'm so hungry. So there is a card. Um, oh, that's, oh, that's nice. Very nice. This is a very nice card. There's a dog. Nice. It's got a stack of books on his head. Well, I, I like to read the card out loud because you know cards are a little little personal. But first snack is something near and dear to our hearts. I feel like a man has listened to this podcast or something because it's Haribo gummy bears. All right, opening so, that immediately. Um, there's a notebook in here. A Tree Street Kids series notebook, oh, like a reporter awesome. notebook for when you're out solving mysteries. Cool. Let's fight to the death and see who gets this. Okay. <laughs> do we do that on you the, agreed to that very do we quickly. Do that on the air or not? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. This is amazing, Graham. Uh, what is this? This is a bag of wrap snacks. Rick what? Ross sweet chili lemon pepper flavored potato chips with Rick Ross on the cover. Oh, my word. <laughs> There's a lot of parents out there that are very, oh my word. very excited about those. Goldfish. Yep. Goldfish. Old standby. So far, I'm I'm just so what happy. Those? What are those? What is this? Candy coated choco rocks. Okay, these look these look so much like real rocks. These look almost identical to the rocks I was eating up in the mountains. But they're candy. <laughs> when you were surviving? <laughs> yeah. I oh. moved on. Yeah, I did leaves and then rocks. Oh, okay. I okay. tried to boil the rocks. They didn't get any softer. Yeah, but I mean, once you get so hungry, you have to eat a rock. You know it's dire. Yeah. You also could have just come down the mountain, but you know. Well, uh, you told me find the golden thing and then that. Yeah. Well, no, I also told uh, you know what? Never mind. Let's not rehash this. More goldfish. Okay. We'll be snacking well on, on these things tonight. What's next? Grab something. All right. What is this one? This is well oh, a second notebook. Oh, we don't have to we fight to the fight. death anymore. All right. We don't have to fight. Right. Oh, look. Two Tree Street Kids pencils, too. That's great because we don't have to fight for the death you over those. You love pencils. Right? You say that with like <laughs> scandal. <laughs> like you're scandalized by it. No, I'm just, I'm happy. Okay. And then at the bottom of this box... Hey, another pencil. Two more pencils. One for each of us. Mm. Now, uh, my can... kids are definitely taking these. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. We also have at the bottom of this box. Oh, oh look this. at that. What is this? Hey, books in the series. Jack versus the Tornado, The Hunt for Fang, Lions to the Rescue, and Mystery in Crooked, Crooked Wood. Look at that. This is awesome. Our very own copies of Tree Street Kids. Now, here's the thing I just noticed about those, Graham. Only one of each. So the possibility of fighting to the death still remains. Okay, good. So we'll, we'll talk good. about it after the episode. And if we don't come back for a second episode or it's just me, then yeah. everyone will know what happened. Speaking of adventure and peril. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we're going to eat some of our favorite snacks. Goldfish, chocolate candy rocks, uh, Haribo gold gummy bears, and wrap snacks. Sweet chili lemon peppers. You know what? Let's try these before we... Before we go before away, we go away. Before we All take right. another break here, I want. Uh, say, up next is lazy words, and we're gonna find out if where you where your brain is after eating. Uh, yeah. So these pepper. these chips are bright. I would say deep red, which makes you makes me think they're gonna be very spicy. Mm hmm. On the bag, it says the goal is to be rich forever. <laughs> <laughs> I. This is so out of nowhere. I don't like. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe Rick Ross found the golden pigeon. Yeah, seriously. Oh, these are great. These are very good. Yeah. There's the sweet chili, and then you get the lemon pepper. A little, it's a little bit, bit of a kick. Of each. Yep. And then, how are those? 
They look exactly like rocks. I realize you said that. Oh, they're not hard at all. They're just chocolate. I think That's I've had amazing. Oh, I think I've had it's these before. Like but... the texture of a Reese's pieces that looks like looks like uh, pebbles. Mm. All right, let's eat the whole thing. Let's, let's go. go. Let's what? let's save these, at least a few of them, and then put them out in the woods. And then if someone's getting lost and is finally like, "Oh, yeah. I'm gonna have to eat the rocks," then they'll be pleasantly surprised when they eat some of these. I'm not putting these in the woods, but I meant like three of them. <laughs> Fine. Okay, you know what? Let's take a break. We're gonna come back with lazy words, but first we're gonna eat some more sweet chili lemon pepper. Uh, wrap snacks and dig into some of this other stuff. So thanks so much to the Tree Street Kids for sponsoring this episode of Withy Wendell and also providing sustenance. Head over to treestreetkids.com to learn more about those books. Okay, we are back, Graham, uh-huh. with the segment that took the podcasting world by storm <laughs> last season. Lazy words. Ironic. <laughs> Graham's Graham's concoction, the concoction of Graham's wild mind. Uh-huh. Uh, lazy words was a big hit, and we are back with more lazy words. Graham, what is this episode's lazy word? Well, I thought for the first. I don't know why I had to go creepy with that one, but I- I'm good with it. I thought for the first, um, the first episode back. Yep. Maybe do something near and dear uh, to our hearts. Okay. You're going to like this one. Okay. All right. Let's say um, there's a place. <laughs> and this place is somewhere where you would go maybe to do some purchasing. Okay. A building of some sort. Yeah. A, a store? Could, uh, could be, yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, it's a, maybe it's a place where, let, let's say... I don't know what it's called exactly, but if you if you, if somebody is like writing down stories and maybe on paper and then binding them, um, like a book, uh huh. But 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 a place where you could go and buy them. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what that's called? Yeah, a uh, bookstore. A book yeah. store. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, this is not lost on me. <laughs> <laughs> You would not be surprised to know how much I have thought about this. Oh, yes. I I am not surprised. So this week's episode, or this week's lazy word. (laughs) This week's episode is brought to you by bookstores. Is bookstore. So can we collectively here come up with a alternate name, a better name? Or do we just need to leave it up to the kids to email us with their suggestion? Bookstore. Very on the nose. It's true. Very boring. It's true. What about you? Understand what it is. It was just an important thing for yeah, business, of course. But, but for a place of magic, wonder, discovery, excitement, a little bland. Magic Emporium. Emporium. Wisdom Emporium. Emporium's good. Book Bookporium. Wonderporium. Wonder Wonderporium. Storyporium. Story. I guess not every book is a story. Mm. Oh, true. True. I think we those. That's a good start. But we know the kids are gonna. Are gonna yeah. like outdo us here? That's because that's kind of like the mo of the show. The kids just do better at us than create on creative things. So Graham, yeah. <laughs> remind the kids how they can get in touch with their answers. Uh, they are gonna write to us at podcasts at goldberrybooks.com. We want to hear what is a better word for bookstore, a better name for bookstore, because then we'd be able to have a better name for bookstore troll, because they would have oh. to be whatever that word is plus troll. Ooh. So, oh, there's implications, huh? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Do I have to then change? Does it have to be Goldberry whatever the kids say instead of Goldberry books? You know what? I don't think so, but maybe if they come up with something great, we can make a tiny sign to put inside, which is a secret true name. The best one? Yeah. We're going to do that. Let's do it. Somewhere in the bookstore, we're going to... Maybe we'll make it a scavenger hunt or something. So when kids who listen to the podcast come into the store, they'll find the secret Withy Wendell... Placard. Uh, placard. Exactly. The sign. Yeah. All right, Graham. That's a great lazy word. You're not that half bad at coming up with these, but like, I mean, you're also not more than half bad, but. Uh, thank you. I'm <laughs> ah, just kidding. You know. <laughs> All right. Should we just go right into the story? I'm so excited. Okay, Graham, it's story time. As I said at the top, one of us is going to bring a story. Each week. Mm. This week, this first episode of the season, it was my turn to bring a story. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. I did not. Because you, you didn't do it. Okay, yeah. Good. So this is a story called The Golden Goose. 
Oh. By Andrew Lang. Not the Golden Pigeon. No, but I did think it was funny that you that we were talking about that. Huh. Uh, which might explain the mistake that we made. Looking for a pigeon instead of a goose. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So this is um, originally collected by the Brothers Grimm in the early 19th century. Heard but of it. It's a classic fairy tale by Andrew Lang. It's from his Red Fairy book, which was published in 1890. So some of the kids may know this one already. Some of them may not. And some of these stories you're going to know, some of them you're not going to know. But hopefully, when you experience them here on Withy Windle, you get a new experience. The true Withy Windle experience with these stories. So, Graham, are you ready to hear the golden goose? Let's go. Okay. There once was a man who had three sons. The youngest of them was called Dullhead. <laughs> okay. And was sneered and jeered at and snubbed on every possible opportunity. Makes sense. One day it happened that the eldest son wished to go into the forest to cut wood. And before he started, his mother gave him a fine, rich cake and a bottle of wine. Sounds like a good day. So that he might be sure not to suffer from hunger or thirst. When he reached the forest, he met a little old gray man who wished him, Good morning. And said, Do give me a piece of that cake you got in your pocket, and let me have a draft of wine. I'm so hungry and thirsty. But this clever son replied, If I give you my cake and wine, I shall have none left for myself. You just go your own way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, what, what what country are these guys from? I don't know. It's you know, it's a it's just a vague place. Okay. Yeah. I was uh, trying to place the accent. Yeah. But, yeah okay. Me too. I was trying right. to place the accent too. <laughs> Stop commenting on the accents, or I'm going to do it to you. <laughs> and he left the little man standing there and went further on into the forest. There he began to cut down a tree, but before long he made a false stroke with his axe. Ooh. <laughs> and cut his own arm so badly he was obliged to go home and have it bound up. Yeah, I would, I, I, I'm would. glad he was obliged to. Then the second son went to the forest, and his mother gave him a good cake and a bottle of wine as she had to his elder brother. How many cakes does this lady have? I don't know, a bunch. He too met the little old gray man who begged him for a morsel of cake and a draft of wine. Okay, yep. Luckily, I don't have to do the accent again because it just keeps going. But the second son spoke <laughs> most sensibly too and said, Whatever I give you, I deprive myself of. Just go your own way, will you? That doesn't sound very sensible to do that to a little gray man in the woods. Certainly not very nice. Not long after, his punishment overtook him. For no sooner had he struck a couple of blows on a tree with the axe than he cut his leg so badly that he had to be carried home. Carried home by who? The gray man? That's a great question. Probably the other leg. So then Dullhead said, Father, let me go out and cut wood. But his father answered, Both your brothers have injured themselves. You'd better leave it alone. You know nothing about it. Hmm. But Dullhead... But his father's giant frog... <laughs> but <laughs> but Dullhead begged so hard to be allowed to go that at last his father said, "Very well then, go. Perhaps <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's good, it's good. Perhaps when you <laughs> hurt yourself, you may learn to know better." Yeah. His mother only gave him a very plain cake made with water and baked in the cinders and a bottle of sour beer. Still a cake. <laughs> I suppose so. When he, got, <laughs> when he got to the forest, he too met the little old gray man who greeted him and said, Don't remember the accent at all. Give me a piece of your cake and a draft from your bottle. I'm so hungry and thirsty. That was not it at all. And yeah. Dullhead replied, I've only got a cinder cake and some sour beer, but if you care to have that, let us sit down and eat. Oh, that's nice of him. Yeah. So they sat down, and when Dullhead brought out his cake, he found it had turned into a fine, rich cake, and the sour beer turned into excellent wine. Wow. Then they ate and drank, and when they had finished, the little man said, Now I will bring you back, because you have a kind heart and are willing to share what you have with others. This is the same accent I did when I was talking to your older brother, definitely. There stands <laughs> an old tree. Cut it down, and amongst its roots you will find something. With that, the little man took leave. Then, Dullhead fell to at once to hew down the tree. And when it fell, he found amongst its roots a... What do you think it was, Graham? Chocolate rock a quarry. A goose, <coughs> whose feathers were all of pure... <coughs> goose down gold. Gold. Goose down gold. I have a lot of questions about how, how feathers would be gold. Are they hard gold, or is it just feathers that are the color of gold? No, gold is a very soft metal. Oh, okay. And the, this goose doesn't need to fly. He obviously doesn't need to fly. He's under a tree. Is it softer <laughs> than chocolate rocks? <laughs> and he's, he's just under a tree. He lifted it out and carried it off and took it with him to an inn where he meant to spend the night. Mm -hmm. Is this a, a, a Ramada? <laughs> they go to the Ramada, the, yeah, the Motel 6? Stayed at a Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn. Oh, yeah, it's an inn, not yeah. a motel. Yeah, yeah. He's got, it's nice. Probably got some uh, continental breakfast. Yeah. 
<laughs> now the landlord of the inn had three daughters, and when they saw the goose, they were filled with curiosity as to what this wonderful bird could be. Yeah. And each longed to have one of its golden feathers. The eldest thought to herself, no doubt, no doubt I shall soon find a good opportunity to pluck out one of its feathers. Mm -hmm. And the first time Dullhead happened to leave the room, she caught hold of the goose by its wing, but lo and behold, her fingers seemed to stick fast to the goose, and she couldn't take her hand away. Yikes. Soon after, the second daughter came in and thought to pluck a golden feather for herself, too. But hardly had she touched her sister than she stuck fast <laughs> as well. At last, the third sister came with the same intentions. But the other two cried out, Keep off! For heaven's sake, keep off! The younger sister could not imagine why she was to keep off and thought to herself, If they're both there, why should I not be there too? As younger sisters would. Yep. So she sprang to them. But no sooner had she touched one of them than she stuck fast to her. <laughs> so they all three had to spend the night with the goose. Very sticky gold. Yeah. <laughs> it's a sticky situation. Stuck. Ooh. But next morning, Dullhead tucked the goose under his arm and went off without in the least troubling himself about the three girls who were hanging on to because it. Because he didn't notice or he's just, he's just dull? I think we should keep reading. Okay. They just had to run after him right or left as best they could. Mm -hmm. In the middle of a field, they met the parson. What's a parson, by the way? Do you know? It's like a, it's kind of like a carrot, but it's white. Uh, it's like a fall root vegetable. I think that's not right. That's a parsnip. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. A parson. Isn't a parson like a, a preacher? Something like that. And when he saw this possession, the parson cried, For shame, you bold girls. What do you mean by running after a young fellow through the fields like that? Do you call that proper behavior? And with that, he caught the youngest girl by the hand to try and draw her away. But directly he touched her, he hung on himself, and he had to run along with the rest of them. Not long after, the clerk came that way and was much surprised to see the parson following the footsteps of three girls. Where is your reverence going so fast? Cried he. Don't forget there is to be a christening today. And he ran after him, caught by the sleeve and hung on to it himself. Makes sense because the accent I just did made him sound kind of dumb. <laughs> As the five of them trotted along in the fashion one after the other, two peasants were coming from their work with their hose. On seeing them, the parson called out and begged them to come and rescue him and the clerk. But no sooner did they touch the clerk than they stuck on too. And so there were seven of them running after Dullhead and his goose. <laughs> After a time, they all came to a town where a king reigned whose daughter was so serious and solemn that no one could ever manage to make her laugh. So the king had decreed that whoever should succeed in making her laugh should marry her. Yeah. She should listen to this podcast is what I say. <laughs> when Dull had heard... Do you think there were podcasts in this world? Mm. When Dull had heard this, he marched before the princess with his goose and its appendages... <laughs> <laughs> now the goose has ownership now over these people. Exactly. Okay. And as soon as she saw these seven people continually running after each other, she burst out laughing and could not stop herself. So does that mean the princess is going to marry Dullhead or the goose? Um, I can't wait. Let's see. Let's see. Then Dullhead claimed her as his bride, but the king, who did not much fancy him as a son-in-law, made all sorts of objections and told him he must find a man who could drink up a whole cellar full of wine. Dull had bethought him of the little gray man who could, he felt sure, help him. So he went off to the forest and on the very spot where he had cut down the tree, he saw a man sitting with the most dismal expression of face. Hmm. Dull had asked him what he was taking so much to heart. And the man answered, I don't know how I'm ever going to quench this horrible thirst I'm suffering from. Cold water doesn't suit me at all. To be sure, I've emptied a whole barrel of wine, but that is one drop on a hot stone. And yes, this is the same accent I used last time I talked to you. <laughs> I think I can help you, said Dullhead. Come with me, and you shall drink to your heart's content. So he took him to the king's cellar, and the man sat down before the huge casks and drank and drank till he drank up the whole contents of the cellar before the day closed. Then Dullhead asked once more for his bride. But the king felt vexed at the idea of a stupid fellow whom people called Dullhead carrying off his daughter, and he began to make fresh conditions. Yeah, I've sympathized with this king. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what if one of your daughters brought home a guy named Dullhead? Yeah, I would make up some serious tasks. Uh, uh, impossible tasks. I think if I was the princess, I would recommend that he change his name to like Joe or Billy or like Colin or something. Puddinhead. Yeah. He required Dullhead. Yeah. Uh, Puddinhead's mildly better than Dullhead. <laughs> he required Dullhead to find a man who could eat a mountain of bread. Dullhead did not wait long to consider, but went straight off to the forest, and there on the same spot sat a man who was drawing in a strap as tight as he could round his body and making a most woeful face the while. Said he, 
I've eaten up a whole oven full of loaves, but what's the good of that to anyone who is as hungry as I am? I declare my stomach feels quite empty, and I must draw my belt tight if I'm not to die of starvation. So, Dullhead, uh, he's got kind of a one-track mind. A little bit. He he keeps going to the exact same spot in the forest. He's like, I I found a solution here once, but he keeps finding solutions. Maybe he's not so dull. True. Dullhead was delighted. And said, get up and come with me and you shall have plenty to eat. And he brought him to the king's court. Now the king had given orders to have all the flour in his kingdom brought together and to have a huge mountain baked of it. But the man from the wood just took up his stand before the mountain and began to eat. And one day it had all vanished. For the third time, Dullhead asked for his bride. But again, the king tried to make some evasion and demanded a ship which could sail on land or water. When you come sailing on such a ship, said he, you shall have my daughter without further delay. Like again, a, this is definitely the same accent I used last time. Was this a hovercraft? He's talking uh, about I think, yeah, he's talking about an airplane, maybe. Is again, this a Dullhead. Chan movie? <laughs> Again, Dullhead started off to the forest, and there he found the little old gray man with whom he had shared his cake, and who said, I have eaten and I have drunk for you, and now I will give you the ship. I have done all this for you because you were kind and merciful to me. Then he gave Dullhead a ship which could sail on land or water, and when the king saw it, he felt he could no longer refuse him his daughter. So they celebrated the wedding with great rejoicings. Hooray! And after the king's death, Dullhead succeeded to the kingdom... And lived happily with his wife for many years after. <laughs> the end. Wait, what, what happened to the goose? <laughs> the goose was... The uh, goose and the people? Man. They all still were stuck and they all... What, did the goose wander into the woods with them? And man doesn't say anything about their fate, does it? This is the great thing about fairy tales. It is. Half of it makes no sense. And half of it makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> And this true. All of it makes no sense. All of it makes no sense, and all of it is wonderful. The interesting thing about these stories is how they kind of got passed down. And I love to imagine, like, what was the first version of the story? And then what yeah. was the second version of the story? Had you ever heard this one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a question for you. Mm-hmm. Do the characters in this story remind you of characters from your home? No, just kidding. From no. any other story. <laughs> Uh, well, sure. I, it's hard for me because I've read so many fairy tales. Yeah, yeah that's true. That like, th- yes, these characters oh. feel very familiar. Okay, let me ask you this question then. Okay. Why do you think so many fairy tales like this and folk tales and fables and all that include characters like the little Meg gray man in the woods with the various accents, mm-hmm. strangely magical creatures who help or, you know, curse people. Yeah. Depending on how they're interacted well, with. I don't want to answer it too specifically with this story at all. Um, but I'd say a lot of these were written as parables and as warnings. Mm. Um, a, a lot of them have, you know, uh, 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 people who in positions where they think they're secure um, or think they're noble in or, or in power yeah, yeah. doing a bad turn to somebody uh, that they feel like is below them. Mm. And sometimes consequences come back in strange ways. Yeah. Um, so there are stories that have something like they want to teach or whatever, but then they also mm-hmm. are just crazy stories that are hilarious and weird and yeah. eccentric and yeah, a and good time. I think they're all very valuable. There's a lot of archetypes in these stories. Yeah, hey, good word, good word. There's a lot of um, uh, motifs that occur again and again. And it's very interesting um, because in a lot of different cultures, folk and fairy tales exist and have kind of grown up over centuries and a lot of them include very similar themes even Mm. though they're thousands of miles away from each other Mm. well that was the first edition graham of story time here on withy wendell i thought it was delightful the first of eight we're gonna have of course at the end of the season our our last episode will be a q a so we don't do all the segments but we're gonna have seven more of these stories next week graham will bring a myth fable folktale or yeah, fairy tale. I've got it picked out. It's great. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will have our interview with Gary Schmidt. Okay, Graham, we are back. Um, you're still eating uh, sweet chili lemon pepper uh, wrap snacks. Oh, yes, I am. And uh, they're delicious. And thank you to the Tree Street Kids and to Amanda. Um, the more I eat, the more I feel like I should wrap. <laughs> Do you want to hear some? Like some presents? Like, do I need to bring like, you know, like a birthday no, present? No, like bust some rhymes out. 
Um, yeah, definitely. Should I do that for the thousands yeah, of people I, listening? You should definitely do that right now, yeah. Oh, actually, the chip is a little stuck oh, in my throat. Stuck in your throat. Yeah, here, here's some water. While you're getting that out, I'm going to tell people about Gary Schmidt. He is the author of children's and young adult fiction books. He currently resides in Michigan, where he is a professor of English at Calvin University. He talks about that a little bit in this interview. He has written a, a number of great books, including Lizzie Bright and the Buckminster Boy, The Wednesday Wars, which is one of his most popular books, Okay for Now, mm. When Came the Stars, Orbiting Jupiter, and just this year, a book, or just last year, rather, uh, a book called Just Like That. So he's a great author. He's a very interesting guy, and we had a great time talking to him. So here he is. Here's our conversation with the great Gary Schmidt. Hope you like it. Well, Gary Schmidt, thanks so much for joining us here in Withy Window. We are incredibly excited to get to chat with you. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's good to be with you guys. We're going to start with um, what we like to say is the most important question that you're going to get asked on this podcast. It's We've been asking this this question since episode one. Are you ready for the challenge of this question? I think I am. We'll see. Okay. Gary, Cheetos or Doritos? Oh, Cheetos. That's not even close. <laughs> oh, yeah, Gary, no. so fast with that answer. Well, of course it's Cheetos. No, no one really, really likes Doritos. I mean, like, unless you like <laughs> chemicals. And you know, get all that, that stuff all over your hands, right? And your your face turns orange mm. and your fingers turn... No, 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 no. It's, it's Cheetos. Isn't it true of all chips, though, that you're going to get stuff no. all over you? No, no, not Cheetos. Cheetos have a kind of elegance and honor and something about them. You know, well given, given that you're about elegance and honor in your snack foods then are you a cookies or cake person cookies and what's your favorite cookie uh, only i mean has to be oatmeal raisin okay so you know chocolate chip if like there's no oatmeal raisin and oatmeal if there's no oatmeal raisin but you know not like you know oreos Something that advertises itself as having double stuff. <laughs> you just don't eat stuff like that. Double stuff? Really? Um, I, I think the oatmeal raisin is an underrated I cookie. I do. I agree. As well. I agree. Um, I agree. And it's even has, it has the advantage of being healthy. Yeah. And all of that is to the good. And, and you, I mean, could, what, you could eat it as a snack after dinner or for breakfast because yeah. it's got oatmeal. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. When, I, when I'm around a group of people and they start besmirching the oatmeal raisin, I'll go along with it. You know, I'll pretend like I don't like it, but then I'll sneak even more into my pockets. Right. When <laughs> yeah. people aren't looking. They yeah. don't they don't realize what they're missing out on. And you might as well not. Well, why try to convert them? You get to eat more of them. Exactly. And, you know, everyone likes chocolate chip. Fine. I mean, if you just want to be among the common herd. <laughs> Exactly. But if you want to be like, you know, refined and honorable and good and noble and true and blue, then you're eating oatmeal raisin cookies. See, this is a guest that has opinions he is willing to take a stand for. <laughs> yeah. There's no waffling here. But speaking of waffles, what's your favorite breakfast food? Eggs. Fried mm -hmm. eggs. Two fried eggs, sunny side up. Every day? I could I, I think I would be dead if I ate it every day. So I decided not to not to do that. Um but I could if they were as healthy as I could, you know, if you could deal with them like that. So I think it would be easy to do that. So instead you eat oatmeal oatmeal cookies. Oatmeal is good for you. Yeah, exactly. Well, oatmeal like takes out all the bad stuff that eggs give yeah. you. And and raisins. See, yeah, this, so they work together. And raisins, right. And yeah. so they work together. Once upon a time of fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I I just got a little bit of rain on me. There's a leak in the roof. Apparently, I'm going to move slightly. So, Graham, you want to ask the next qu next question? Will I move? <laughs> <laughs> David, what what nobody can see right now except us is David's in a a shed, um, his shed, but he's currently renovating it. And uh, yeah, it it looks pretty rough in there. I, it's, shed is kind of a harsh term for it. Uh uh uh. It's a um, a studio space. How about that? That's nice. Yeah, standalone that, studio space. That's better. <laughs> All right. So, Gary, um, as we move along, um, before we get into some of the kids' questions, uh, we like to give the author uh, kind of an an opportunity to either talk about their work or maybe talk about your latest book, um, which I believe is just for now, um, or really talk about anything you'd like to. 
Um, so if you'd want to give an elevator pitch for who you are and what you do, uh, feel free to do that. Or if there's a sp specific book you think you should talk about, uh, go for that one. Wow, that's what it gives me the world, doesn't it? I, I, guess, I guess I'd say um, if we had talked even, I don't know, maybe even 10 years ago or so, and you asked, like, like, like you met me on a plane and mm -hmm. you asked me what I did, I think I would have said to you, I'm a teacher because so much of my time in my life is really about teaching. Um, I teach at Calvin University here, so I teach undergraduates, but I've also spent four years teaching at a, a maximum security prison, and I do a lot of gigs, so I teach a lot um, at various middle schools. And that's, that has been, I guess, some of the great joy of, of my life is, is, in fact, that I get to do that. And the fact that I can then write as well um, and have that as a second career, as a, as a career on, together with that, is mm -hmm. like this enormous blessing for me. Um, that I get to do the two things that I really love most in the world um, in terms of my profession. It's, mm. It seems unusual um, to me. Like, I don't know many people who love even one job that they have, <laughs> but I have two that I really, really love. So I think it's uh, the whole writing gig, the whole, that whole portion of, portion of me is, is something that feels every day I'm just so grateful for that I get mm. to do that. Mm. And, you know, it's, it is it never ceases to amaze me how, how odd it is in a way. Like you sit in the study and you, I would use a typewriter, you work at your typewriter and, you know, you, you get put these words together and then you send it out and it goes through this process and then someone actually reads it. I mean, that's kind of amazing if you think <laughs> about it. It's just kind of an amazing process that leads to that. Every so often, and this happened the other day, someone sends me a picture of the, of, their kiddo reading one of my books and they're sitting there, you know, with a novel in front of them. And I look at it in amazement hmm. and it's, it just it feels to me like, wow, this actually really, really happens. So I guess when I think of myself as a writer, I think of myself as just being really blessed and really grateful for the opportunity. Do you know when you knew you wanted to be a writer? Yeah, it was like, it was like 50. I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> It wasn't when I was a kid. Um, hmm. huh. It wasn't really like that at all. I was a terrible reader and was in, in a very, very, you know, you know the class in your elementary school where you're given like a vegetable name, but everyone knows it's the stupid class. <laughs> That's the class I was in. <laughs> and it was, uh, I had a great teacher who got me out of that and taught me to read kind of late. Hmm. But I never imagined all the way through school that I would be a writer. I mean, I just couldn't even imagine it. And then I went to um, to college and graduate school after that. And I did see myself as writing for like a, like a university press. And I do do that. I do enjoy writing those books. But even then, it was a while until I got to this position where I thought, you know, I could let me try this because I think I would enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I did. I really, really loved writing the novels. I just mm -hmm. it was a so fun exercise. So when you started doing that and you started writing novels, you were started writing fiction. Was the idea from the get go to write novels that were f that were oriented towards kids? Yeah, I was teaching children's literature as an academic, right? So it seemed to me that one thing that would help me do that, it would give me some authority in the classroom anyway, would be in fact to to write. I mean, I teach medieval literature, but you know what? No one from the Middle Ages is writing anymore; they're all dead. <laughs> and so it seemed to me that I could, if I was writing in this field that might help me in the classroom. And so in some ways that was an initial um, impetus, I guess, a, a one, one thing that would help me do, go ahead and try it. Now, um, Gary, you say you didn't read much as a kid, but was there any particular books that you remember uh, really liking um, when you were younger? Yeah, I mean, it's probably sitting over on my shelf here. Uh, it was in second or third grade. And I think the author's name is Gene Merrill, and it's called The Pushcart War. Um, hmm. I loved it so much that at the end of the school year, I couldn't bear to leave it behind me. And so I stole it. And so it's, I, I really think it's somewhere on the shelf over here. <laughs> I, took a few minutes, I can show you this paperback copy of, of The Pushcart War. Because who knows? I, never, I thought I'd never see it again, you know? And after all, I loved it more than anyone else, so I should have it, right? I mean, there's justice there. <laughs> well, <laughs> here I, you I, are, all these years later. <laughs> there we go. Um, and then we had this series of readers. Uh, there were three readers together 
I don't even remember what they were called. But I spent years trying to find them uh, as an adult because mm. I love them so much. And I did find them. Um, and those are at home, actually. And I think I love them because they had these great myths and epics. Um, Beowulf was in it. Um, mm. You know, tearing off Grendel's arm. How cool is that? <laughs> and um, all these Pecos Bill and all these great, oh, yeah. great episodes. I had never encountered them before, though I was very young. And I love them. I just love the sort of over-the-top stories, these impossible things that, that they were doing. Um, and I still love those. I still like those a lot. So what about um, now that you've been teaching children's literature for a long time, what are the, what are the standout books to you now? Oh, my gosh. Any, well, Daniel, I would say Daniel Neary is, um, is, is one of the best I've read in a very long time. Anything by Catherine Patterson, um, I think, is just standard. So, you, you mean, you would start with Bridget Tarabithia, obviously, and go from there. Anything by M.T. Anderson, by Tobin Anderson, I would also say is just so unbelievable. I mean, who else on the planet um, could take, uh, what's the book where, um, City, City for the, oh, wait, Symphony for the City of the Dead. I mean, he takes, he takes a story about Shostakovich writing a symphony. I mean, who could possibly take that story and make that interesting for a young reader? I mean, no one, no one could do that. But he did, and mm. you, know, you would go through that page, those, that book, and you just can't put it down. I still, I've been trying to figure this out how how he did it. It's just amazing. Mm. Um, book Thief for Young Adult, I think, is one of the great books of the world. Um, mm. I tried to figure out what he's done too. I mean, how many times does he tell you in that book? The narrator says to you, "Rudy's going to die." You know that Rudy's going to die. I'm telling you, Rudy's going to die, and the whole way through, you're thinking, "No." No, Rudy's not, he's not going to kill off Rudy. There's no way that he's going to die. And the whole time you're just, you're just saying, no, you're a liar. I don't believe you. And then Rudy dies and you can't believe it. You can't mm. be stunned. How, does he, point. Get, how mm. does he do that? It's, it's brilliant. I mean, I just love that stuff. And Kevin Hankus for the younger um, crowd, the Billy Miller books are, are, are stunners. Mm. And, I mean, they, in some ways, they're super retro, right? They're books that are aimed at a second, third grade um, level, and yet they, not yet, and they are incredibly gripping. Mm. I mean, you can't put them down once you start that. So, yeah, it's, uh, there's so much good stuff out there now. And it does, I'm teaching a course in the graphic novel right now. Mm. You are, uh, again, it's just stunning how much good stuff is out there and how how much of a crossover there is. I mean, I just taught the Nimona, Nimona um, to my students. And one of the students says, I can't believe, these are college students, I can't believe that I like this. I'm a college student, yeah. but it's aimed at like a fifth, fifth grade, maybe fourth, fifth, sixth grade audience. And it's, she's right. I mean, he's right. It was it's a stunning book, no matter what the age. Hmm. So yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot that's out right now that's, that's just wonderful. Well, we should probably dig into some of these questions from these kids because, you know, that, that's really why we're here. So Izzy, who is 13, has two questions that may or may not be related to one another, and I'll let you make connections if, if appropriate. First, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? And two, when is your next book coming out? <laughs> uh, favorite ice cream is mint chocolate chip. Um, I mean, that's, that's as a, you know, a kind of a given, like any good person has a favorite ice cream is mint chocolate chip, right? I mean, yeah. Like, how many ice creams are green? And this is a green one. So how cool is that? Do you have a soul? Well, then mint chocolate chip. <laughs> as far as the next book, um, let's see, it's called the, the Labors of Hercules Beale. And it's a kiddo who um, is challenged to reenact the Labors of Hercules but he's alive today and he lives on Cape Cod. And that one, I think, I think, I think, I think is out in the springtime. And then there'll be um, a collect some anthologies that I'm working on. And the, those will probably be out in a year. So I think there'll be two or three out next year. Wow. You're not Excellent. busy at all. That is awesome news. Um, Addy, who is age 11, uh, wants to know, how do you come up with your characters' names? Like Hauling Hood Hood and Meryl Lee Kowal Kowalski. <laughs> you know that I, I wish I had someone to help me with that because it, it is that is really hard character for me. Mm -hmm. Character names are like nightmares. 
And so um, if you if you had my first draft, and remember, I do this on a typewriter, so it's I can be as messy as I want. Um, all of my hmm. characters are named after Avi, the writer Avi. So if you looked at her first draft, you would see <laughs> Avi said to Avi, let's go over to Avi's house. Maybe Avi will be there. And, I mean, and then I just stick them in as I figure out what the yeah. names are. But Avi is, you know, AVI is just really, really quick. So I can, I can type it in fast. And yeah, it's just a way of it. And then it really, I have to wait until they come. Um, and I, I wish I could be more, I mean, that sounds like voodoo, right? And I don't mean it to be like that. Mm. But it, they have to have some meaning, some connection. Um, I'm a big fan of, of Dickens. I love to read a Dickens novel. And he has mm. the most brilliant names. He's so, so good at it. Um, and I wish I could be as good as he is on it. But I just wait until they until they seem to appear. So Holling uh, actually followed Hood Hood. So I had Hood Hood first. And that's a real name here in, uh, where I live in Grand Rapids. And my son was running with a guy named Sean Hood Hood um, cross country in high school. So every time David would run by, I'd yell, go David, go David. And then Sean would run by and I would yell, go Hood Hood, go Hood Hood. And I'd fall on the ground because right? it's the funniest name I've ever heard. That's great. So Hood, I got that, Hood Hood. And then I needed one that goes with it. And there's a writer named Holling Clancy Holling, who did nonfiction in the yeah, 50s, 60s. Yeah. Did a book called um, Paddle to the Sea. It's a known one. Already, that's a funny name, right? Holling Holling. That's his name, Holling Holling. So I just took the Holling there. It goes with Hood Hood, right? The age show thing is going. <laughs> and all, um, that seemed to work really well. Merrily Kowalski is to, to play on the word merrily. So, you know, row, row, row your boat, merrily, we were along. And I thought that was hysterically funny. And um, you have to, you know, you're sitting by yourself on a typewriter. You have to amuse yourself somehow, right? So that felt like just the right one um, to me. Uh, Turner was, uh, I had a, sometimes I just look at books on my shelf and I had on my, on my desk um, Frederick Jackson Turner's book about the West. And Turner was just perfect. And I thought this, and because mm. he turns and he changes. So that seemed really good. And the new one, Hercules Beale, Hercules is this little kid. Um, and he has lost his parents. And so I had to figure out some way that he was going to recover from that. And then I'm just messing around in some of the Greek myths. And Hercules is challenged to do these 12 chores, these 12 labors after he loses mm. his family. And it just seemed, okay, there it is. Um, I named this kid Hercules. He's going to have a teacher who at first is just giving him a hard time to do these labors. But in mm. fact, he's doing the same thing that the mythical Hercules is doing. But I had to wait for all of that stuff and just um, let, let the story mm. develop. And then the name will eventually come. You've been talking about um, typewriters here. Mm. And so what, what kind of typewriter do you use? And weirdly, well, I don't know if it's weird. Interestingly, <laughs> a lot of kids are really into typewriters these days. And we have a couple typewriters in the shop and they just come and they say, oh my gosh, it's a typewriter. Really? And then they like to take a look at it and, you know, open the hood and all that. So well, what, what yeah, kind of, it's, yeah, it's so tactile. Yeah, it's, right. Yeah, exactly. What kind of typewriter do you use? My father was a, a banker. And when they moved from... Um, manual typewriters to electric typewriters and like whatever the year was, they were throwing out all their old typewriters. Mm. And they had um, 1953 Royal, Royal oh, wow. typewriter manual. And, you know, they're made out of like battleship iron, right? They yeah. weigh 70 pounds. Yeah. So we brought it home um, and I have typed everything from middle school onto this last novel on that typewriter. Mm. You know, I can't send that into a publisher, obviously. So yeah. the last the last stage of any any work is going to be me transcribing from um, you know the whatever I'm I'm typing on the, the graph paper or whatever, and then putting that into a computer, and that's always a little bit um, boring because it's all done. I'm just literally typing 300 pages, or it is sort of well, not, or and it is kind of celebratory because the the work is really done by then. I can just move it into the into the um, into a computer. But I love to do it. I mean, it's. I suppose we all like the tools that we're used to, even if they're mm -hmm. not new necessarily. Yeah. But, you know, we all have, I'm sure you guys have a hammer that is probably out of date in terms of whatever, but you've used it for a long time. 
And so you enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for me, I mean, I have a, I split a lot of wood and I have a mall that is so beat up. It shouldn't, I shouldn't even be using it, but I love the feel of the handle. It's used to me. I'm used to it. I mean, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so for the typewriter, it's, it's just, I sit down and it's like, oh yeah, here we go. I know how to do this. <laughs> and, um, I, I love, and I like to have paper. I like to see paper piling up. Um, oh yeah. On the other uh, when I revise and I, you know, cut and paste, I literally take my pages and I cut them up um, hmm. and then I tape them onto other pages. And this sort of like, you know, you mentioned um, tactile before. That's exactly right. The feel of it is part of what's going on there. Hmm. You know, when you type on a computer, and this is just me, when you type on a computer, it looks so very good because it's even spell checked and just looks good. And you print it out and it's perfect. But when my rough drafts are coming along, I can see that there's still rough drafts. Yeah. Still, yeah. <laughs> um, and I could never send this into my to my editor, never. Mm -hmm. um, so and that helps me to remind to it helps to be reminded that there's a lot of work always still to do. Mm -hmm. That's that's such a good point that your rough drafts you have a visual cue, an yeah. obvious visual cue that it's rough. Exactly. Whereas on the computer, it looks identical. Right. Whether it's exactly. the first or the tenth draft, that is fascinating. Um, uh, here is a question from Jamie. It's a little bit heavier. Uh, she says that illness, pain, and death figure into many of your stories in significant ways. Um, how do you go about navigating those big issues with such skill? Wow. Um, well, that is a heavy question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I guess I think there's a lot of people, a lot of writers who are incredibly um, funny. And there's a lot of writers who have a lot of great, uh, they're more adventurous. I mean, Roland Smith, who I love. Um, and there's a lot of writers who do many different things, series books and all those sorts of things that I admire so, so much. I think maybe my thing is that um, I want to be super honest about life and about living. And I want to be sure to say that there really are hard times that kids go through. Mm. And I don't want to pretend that there aren't. Mm. Um, and that there are times when, when children still are facing extraordinary difficulties. And I'm fascinated by their ability to recover. Mm. So I think a lot of my books, even those that are meant to be more funny than not, or lighter than that, are really about um, a kid who is faced with really ultimate things. And I am so, uh, I don't know what the word is, just blown away so frequently by kids who I see like that, who are um, filled with courage or are filled with determination or not being um, destroyed by what, they, what, what the circumstances that they're in. I was in a prison for young boys. I'm talking eighth grade, a prison mm. for eighth grade boys. Then there's 40 kids in this prison. And I met a, a group of them who were in this writing workshop. And when we're talking just about writing, this, um, this kid says, you know, I'm a writer too. And I said, really, um, what do you write about? His name was Jake. What do you write about? And he says, the planet's. I write about the planets. Jupiter is my favorite planet. Hmm. Now, how can you not look at a kid like that? An eighth grader, he'd been in prison for a year. He had seen no one from his family in that hmm. whole year. How can you not look at a kid like that who's been so damaged and had such a hard, hard life? And he says to you, Jupiter is my favorite planet. He lives in a place where there are no windows. And hmm. I, I looked at that kid and I thought, you know, I'm never going to forget you. What an amazing, an amazing thing to say. Mm. Um, so I, I guess I am, I, I guess that's how I see my contribution to the conversation that I hope a lot of YA kids are, are having, that maybe I can be the kid, I can be the writer who says, you know what, it's a pretty broken world and it's really hard and there's awful things that can happen and they just don't go away easily if they go away at all, but that, and even with all of that, it's also a beautiful, amazing world and so worthy the winning. 
but let's keep trying. Hmm. So I, I guess that's how I would answer her. That's a hard question, but I think that's at least the mindset I bring to it. There's a question here from Leah that I want to ask. That's uh, maybe something somewhat related. It says, have you ever had a moment like at the e end of, okay, for now, um, this is how she put it, when something seemed to go terribly wrong, but you were able to savor being okay anyway? If so, is that what inspired you to write the end of the book that way? Yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, I think I think uh, many of us have had that. I mean, okay, for now, was written during cancer, and so um, Lil has cancer, and so at the at, at the end of that, I remember finishing chemo, and thinking, "Wow, I'm not going to die after all," and. Mm. And then because you've had chemo, it's really a long time before you, you kind of get that stuff out of you. But I remember there was a day, it was an April day, and it was about a year after I was done, and I was pretty sure that we're going to make it. And I felt good. I just felt physically good. Hmm. And it was a beautiful, beautiful April day. And I remember thinking, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's hmm. what that's like. Hmm. And just being filled with joy about it. Um, and I think we've all had that. It was, um, my wife died nine years ago. Hmm. And um, Orbiting Jupiter is really about me and Anne. And there was a, a year went by and it was awful. It was really awful. And there hmm. was a night in, um, I don't know, deep winter. And we were in the, I was in the back of the fields behind our house. With, we have two border collies, so I'm mm -hmm. back there with the dogs. And it was one of those days, probably you guys don't get this in the Carolinas, I guess. Um, it was wicked cold at night. It had snowed, and then the clouds had cleared away, and there was a full moon. And when that light hits the new snow, it's like there are diamonds everywhere. And I'm way in the back of the field, and I'm looking across the field. The dogs are playing. It's late at night. And the house is in the distance and the yellow lights are on and it's so warm and so beautiful. And I remember thinking sort of similarly, um, oh, I'm happy. I'm really mm. happy. And I think it was the first time I kind of remembered what it was like to be happy um, a year or so after Anne had died. Mm. And I, those are really powerful memories for me. And I do think in some ways that's, that informs the book. Um, so, okay, for now, I mean, Lil's going to make it. And in fact, in a later book, Pay Attention, Carter Jones, you hear that Lil makes it. And in, uh, you know, in, in Orbiting Jupiter, um, it's a little sadder, but there's still a sense that you're going to recover um, from things. Hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. I think I bring a lot of my own life and experience into books. I'm sure all writers do that on some level. You bring your who you, what you're what you're experiencing into your books. Graham, this is, he's talking about, you know, being happy even in the face of difficult things. And there's two questions here about food that I'd like to ask because <laughs> they mention that there seems to be, you know, it seems as if there's a joy that, we, well, we were talking, you know, you get it from oatmeal cream or not uh, oatmeal rain cookies, right? <laughs> oatmeal cookies. Yeah. But, uh, so Amy asks, how often did you want to eat a cream puff as you described how light and fluffy they were? And then Millie asked, I would love to hear your story about learning how to drink a really cold Coke that keeps, comes up so often. Is there a story behind that? So these two, <laughs> these, these, uh, these food uh, questions, these food, food seems to bring you some sort of joy too. Is, uh, <laughs> and oh, the kids yeah. are seem to be pick, picking up on that. Well, and when I was in middle school, I mean, yeah, food is important, obviously. And you, um, and you don't just want to sit at a meal and sort of eat cardboard. I mean, you want to have some sort of amazing experience each time. So the the uh, the cream puffs they were really um, chocolate eclairs. And I was at a bar mitzvah, and I remember, I remember, uh, and so I'm 13, um, bar mitzvah with one of my friends, and we are sitting in this table, and we had eaten so much. I thought I was going to throw up, and this guy came around with these silver trays filled with chocolate eclairs and they look like i mean it just looks like fantastic and i looked at sean and sean looked at me and i go i know i'm gonna throw up if i eat one of those and sean said to me you will never forget your whole life that you turned down one of those chocolate <laughs> you will never forget it 
And it's true. I mean, it, I'm, you know, it's like half a century later, and I still remember that time <laughs> when those players around. Um, I yeah, don't know. Amazing. Food, amazing. And the, the Coke thing is from, um, uh, I, I grew up on Long Island, and one of the nicest beaches on Long Island is Jones Beach. And we used to go there, geez, every, every week, at least once a week during the summer. We're only 10 miles from the shore. So we would go there and um, you'd spend the day at the beach. And by the time you were done, you were so hungry. I mean, you were just so hungry and, and thirsty and such. And there was a dispenser that you could get Coke in. And I still remember this. I mean, it's so, so unhygienic. I can't believe we did it. Um, <laughs> you know, you put in your... Kids don't know anything about that. Whatever, right? And a cup comes down and then ice comes down. And then the Coke fills it in and then you pull the cold, you know, waxy cup out. So there's no bottle or anything and nothing has ever tasted as good. I, mean, <laughs> I don't think there's a bottle of wine that could ever compare to the taste of a, of a really, really cold Coke mm. uh, at the beach, especially. So yeah, I, think I remember those well. Well, we have a whole segment on this podcast right before the guest where we uh, talk about our favorite snacks and things that we're eating. So we can definitely <laughs> relate to, uh, to this. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, go ahead. Yeah, we have the palate of a nine-year-old. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you're in good company here, it sounds like. Um, all right, so we got a few. Let's do these ones uh, rapid fire. Um, Leah wants to know, who is your favorite baseball player? Joe Pepitone. Oh. I mean, just just say his name and you like him, right? Joe Pepitone. He made lots of bad decisions. The end of his career was a disaster. But the middle of his career was... It was just cool. He hit one. He was one of the three guys who hit three successive home runs in a World Series for the Yankees. Um, if I could have had one, if I could have met one ball player, it would have been Joe Pepitone. Hmm. Do you still watch baseball regularly? No, I really don't. I, I mean, I live in Michigan. We have teams that that break your heart all the time. I mean, I live with the Detroit Lions. I mean, come on. And so. <laughs> So that's enough of a, of a heart wrencher. <laughs> All right. Uh, numbers seem to have a big role in helping Doug deal with hard things. Do you have a favorite number? Wow, I do not. Um, and I never have. I, boy, I've never even thought of that. No, I don't. Boy, that's a disappointing answer. Sorry. <laughs> well, now you can think about it. Uh, okay. 3,000 uh, 3,410. <laughs> Leah also wants to know, which of the birds in OK For Now do you relate with the most? The tern, the Arctic tern. At the very beginning, Doug thinks that this tern is falling into the ocean and is completely, you know, just completely out of touch and, and he's going to die and he's completely alone and uh, he's going to plummet down into the water and that will be the end. And then at the end of the story, um, he flips it. So that now he sees this bird as um, powerful and as strong and as going, you know, wherever the heck he wants to go. So I really, really like that bird. Plus, it's just an elegance. I mean, the, the illustration of it is so stunning and amazing. And if you see an original, I mean, there's only 118 on the planet now of the original books. But they're, they're life size. I mean, they're elephant folio. Those pictures are huge. And to see the original for the Arctic turn, I mean, you just look at it and go, wow. You know, if, if Audubon had only done that, that one painting, he would still be known today. Mm. Uh, one more question, and then we're going to dive into a quiz here. Uh, Anna wants to know, uh, what was your He's inspiration? shaking his boots. <laughs> <laughs> Anna wants to know, what was your inspiration for Wednesday's Wars? Was it based on your childhood? Yeah, and most of that is true. Um, in fact, almost everything in that book is true but exaggerated. Um, so it is my school, an elementary school. Um, it was the case that on Wednesday afternoons, everyone who was Jewish left around one thirty or so to get ready for bar mitzvahs, Hebrew school. And then soon after that, kids who were Catholic and Lutheran, they left to do catechism stuff. And so in that sixth grade classroom, I was the only kid left behind. And the teacher, um, and that was her name, by the way, Mrs. Baker, really hated my guts. Because, I mean, and I can see it why, you know, I mean, if I had been Jewish, say, or if I had been Catholic, I would be gone. 
and she has two free hours every Wednesday. And all the other teachers had that, but not mine. She had to stay. And I can see why she would be ticked. Um, I can <laughs> also see, as a teacher myself, what an amazing opportunity it would have been for her to say, I have two hours with this guy every Wednesday. We can do something amazing together. And so the Mrs. Baker in the novel is much more empathetic and a much better teacher than the actual model for her. <laughs> but yeah, most of that is all straight. That's wonderful. So, so Graham, it's quiz time. Oh, man. Gary, Gary seems a little... Uh, trepidatious. A little, little trepidatious, no, you yeah. Finish, yeah. You finish school, you walk out, you graduate, you get your cap, whatever it is. And then you you turn to someone next to you and say, I will never take another test my whole life. <laughs> I'll just give them to people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so we get to turn the tables. I, I like that. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So this, uh, uh, Gary, this is a Wednesday quiz. Wednesday quiz. <laughs> Gary, I'm with you. I don't know the I don't know the questions either. So this will be, uh, <laughs> be interesting when, for me too. When David and I come up with these quizzes, quizzes we don't sh- share them with each other beforehand. So <laughs> I like seeing his reaction and your reaction. Bye. <laughs> uh, okay. So each one of these questions is multiple choice, and they all have to do with uh, something to do with Wednesday. Okay. However tenuous. All right. So question number one. You're already smiling. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> something evil and malevolent going on here. Okay. No, no, no. All right. Uh, all right. Question number one. In Japanese, oh, geez. <laughs> the word for Wednesday, suiyobi, means water day as it's associated with the planet Mercury, Suisei, which means water star. So I got to thinking, okay, water star is just an incredible name. That's uh, a good... Yeah. So let's say we could instantly transport you to the water star, a water star. All right, what would be the first thing you would do there? Would it be <laughs> A? You only have three options, apparently. Would it be A? Would you uh, bring your surfboard and surf the star? B, go fishing in the star to see what you could catch. Or C, pour loads of tea bags into it and change it into the first ever sweet tea star. Go. (laughs) Jeez. That's definitely a surfboard. Okay. Um, Absolutely, definitely. It is... What was the second one again? Uh, Go fishing to see what what you could catch. Because as soon as someone says, do you like to go fishing... Or would you go fishing? I always point out that no one ever catches anything when they go fishing. It's all just a big lie. (laughs) And they they stop at the supermarket and get a slab of white fish or something. Um, So sometimes they even do it in the cold. Not infrequently, and it's I never catch a blooming thing. Um, Yeah, tea tea would be interesting. (laughs) I'm not sure a planet of tea would work. (laughs) Sweet tea. So yeah, but we don't know. Nobody's tested this. No one's tested it. (laughs) <laughs> All right, surf the star. I think that's the correct answer. It sounds does, like the most fun. It does seem right. I mean, that could be the title of a book. Indeed. All right, Logan, sure. Logan, do the uh, correct answer noise. Put that in here. Okay. Uh, all right, question two. In Britain, they have a soccer or football team called the Sheffield Wednesday. All right. Wow. Why are they named so? Is it A, they named themselves after the day on which they play their matches? B, they're always middle of the patch, much like how Wednesdays are middle of the week. Or C, we'll never know. People did weird things in the 19th century. <laughs> does this have a right answer? This one like, actually does, does. Yeah, this one does. Does have a right answer? Uh-huh. A, a seems too likely. So I'm going to go with B, that they see themselves in the middle of the patch. <laughs> the answer is A. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, they played on Wednesday, so they just named themselves Wednesday. Oh my god! But you're right. How ridiculous! That is kind of like the Cleveland Browns, though. They were like, "Our my name is Brown, so now we're the <laughs> Cleveland Browns." <laughs> <laughs> Question number three: On Wednesday, May tenth, seventeen ninety seven, the first U.S. Navy ship called the United States, again with the lazy names, uh, the first <laughs> U.S. Navy ship was launched. Uh, where and how was it launched? Was it launched from A, Connecticut, shot out of a cannon, B, from Rhode Island, strapped to a rocket, 
or C, from Philadelphia, the normal way a ship is launched? We'll see. It seems so obvious, right? That it's got to be C. But now, now I don't trust you anymore. <laughs> because I avoided the obvious one before. But I'll go with it again, C. All right, you got. Okay. Yep, you're you're right. I was trying to throw you off a little bit. Okay, okay. How ridiculous the other answers were. It is C. Yes, correct. All right, last question. All right, as all the kids know. <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> already you're laughing. As all the kids know, the 1977 concept album "The Rambler" by Johnny Cash <laughs> contains the catchy tune called "A Wednesday Car." Okay, if you could drive any car on a Wednesday, which of these would you choose? A, 1981 Plymouth Reliant K, which is slow and dependable because Wednesday is not a day to get anywhere in a hurry. B, a 1967 Chevy Camaro to help you muscle through to the end of the week. Or C, a 1998 Dodge Viper so you can speed all the way to the weekend. Wow. Do you know, I think I take B, the idea of muscling through. Because Wednesdays, you sort of feel like the day, like the week is much over, right? But there's still a lot to go. <laughs> and so sometimes you really do have to just gather up your, your strength and your abilities just to get through the rest of the week. I would go with B on that one. I think that's the correct answer as well. All right. So according to my calculation, uh, you have three out of four correct, which is a completely passing grade in our standard, but we will have to send this away to get evaluated. So we'll yeah, let you know right. six to eight weeks, you know, with the official report. Okay. Yeah. That sounds really good. It has to go good. through a, um, a very specific Scantron machine in, uh, and actually in Long Island, now that you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that is the end of the quiz. Well done, Mr. Schmidt. I passed. You did. I'm kind of sweating that. Well, th this brings us now to to the word of the week. Are you ready to put your your writerly creative hat on and see if you can come up with the correct answer for this very strange word? Is this a real word? It is a real word. All three okay. of us are going to uh, we're going to try to figure out what it is. We have um, a word of the week printer. Well, we did it. Um, <laughs> it eventually became sentient and um, wandered off. Uh, that was a couple seasons ago. Um, then we created, between seasons two and three, a Word of the Week dictionary. I thought I was going to get ahead of the game. But the bookstore troll, being a troll, he he stole the, the Word of the Week dictionary. Oh. So we had to kind of uh, give him various gifts throughout season three to, you know, to, to get him to give us the Word of the Week each week. Well, as people know, if they listen to the trailer for this season, Gargle Hauser, the bookstore troll, has he has set off on a journey. And um He's left us. He he took the, the dictionary with him. And uh luckily though, he has sent us a postcard. And uh Graham, should I read this week's postcard? Because I, I think he sent one that will that, that's got the word of the week in it. Oh yeah, read that out. I want to hear this. Okay, so I'm gonna unwrap this postcard that he sent us. Okay, um all right, here we go. Dear frenemies, stop. <laughs> I am on the port of a major nope, I am he, he okay, he is very bad handwriting. Um I am on the dock of a major port city on the east coast. Stop. Need some time away. Stop. Looking for a friend. Stop. Forgot to leave dictionary. Stop. Here is the word. Oh, okay. Now I'm supposed to unwrap this. And here is our word of the week. It is snickersnee. Snickersnee. S-N-I-C-K-E-R-S-N-E-E. -E -E. Snickersnee. So we're going to take a minute. If we can figure out what this word means, we'll come back. We'll reveal what we think it means before ultimately unveiling the real definition. Gary, are you ready to, to think for a second? Yeah. All right. Can you say it one more time? Yeah, it is snickersnee. S N I C K E R S N E E. All right, we are back. As is our custom, Graham will go first, then I will go, 
and then our guest of honor will go third and then we'll unveil the real the real definition see who got closest mr Pittman, go first take it away what does snickers right. name mean i'm very happy to report that on this the first episode of season four I, I already know I've got the correct answer because uh, you say this a lot. You Snickers say that a lot. Knee, you're very confident a lot well, of times knee when you're wrong. Is a um is an official diagnosis and I have it. <laughs> so once you've ingested a critical mass of peanuts, chocolate, and nougat, your body can't break it down and metabolize it well. It has to go somewhere in your body. It it the, the Snickers uh collect into your knee, much like gout in your big toe. I was gonna say, are you confusing this with gout? No, it's different <laughs> than gout. Snickers knee. We know you know about gout. Graham. Different things. So okay. That's it. Snickers knee. Final answer. Ding, ding, ding. Correct. Is that why my knees crack when I? When uh, I you should get. You should look into squat it. Squat to a stamp. <laughs> you should get look into it. Get well, a blood draw. I don't know. I think that Snickers knee is actually that feeling of profound disappointment you get when you've been ice fishing all day and all you catch is a frozen <laughs> boot. Oh no. That's Snickers knee. The feeling of disappointment you get when you've been ice fishing all day and all you catch is a frozen boot. And we know, Gary, that sounds like something that would just be your worst your worst nightmare. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, I've been in ice ice houses like that and I always think, this is how people die. <laughs> they stay out there too long or they have some sort of warming device inside their, inside their ice house and then they, I mean, I live in Michigan, people plummet through the ice all the time. <laughs> oh man no well, so this is clearly it's an adjective it's meant to describe someone so a snickers knee person um is about someone who who t- tries like he's always making fun of other people he's always being uh, and laughing at them in a mean sort of way like, mm. like it's, he's the bully like a, a sneakers knee bully who wow. wants he, just before he rips your face off he laughs, right? It's that, that laugh. The cackle. The, the oh. cackle's a better word. That's right. That's right. Mm. Well, it's like it's like a it's like a harsher snicker. Hey, yeah. um, did the troll also uh, put the definition on the postcard? Yeah, yeah. I was going to flip it over. Oh, no, okay. he, there's a little it. thing you got to peel off on the bottom of it. He <laughs> he seems to went to go, went to a lot of trouble from whichever yeah. eastern seaboard port city he's in. I also um, like how he confused telegraph and postcard. Like he was, I know he, he doesn't know what he, he Graham, was sending. Graham, he he's he is a bookstore troll. True. Yeah, we should. He be is proud only of just now he... getting out into the world and okay. learning about civilized things, uh, such as telegrams. So yeah, here's the answer and. A Snickers knee is. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> a, sn- <laughs> a Snickers knee refers to a large and super sharp knife. Really? Yeah. Hmm. That's not a, a large- example here. Is that's not a Snickers knee? This is a Snickers knee. <laughs> <laughs> Which is which is a great example when you're doing a word when you're trying to figure out what a word is. Is this like a whaling term or what are we talking <laughs> That's about? That's a great question. I don't know the derivation of it. I should figure that out. So isn't there that that scene it's in a crocodile dundee movie yeah. where he's about to get into a knife fight and one guy pulls out a small knife and then crocodile dundee pulls out the big one? Yeah, and wouldn't yeah. that be perfect if you said this is a, this is a <laughs> sticker snee? <laughs> and the guy would have looked at him and goes, What? <laughs> so so actually this is interesting i just googled it the word snickers knee actually shows up in the gilbert and sullivan uh gilbert and sullivan's mikado really the line as i gnashed my teeth when from its sheath i drew my snickers knee <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah so that's pretty great that's great well that brings us to the end of this week's word of the week thank you to Gargelhauser for actually providing that but you know no thanks to him for taking the dictionary, but you know, what are you going to do? He's yeah. a bookstore troll. How else are we ever going to look up a word? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Gary, this is the final question. Thank you so much for coming on. Awesome. Do you have any advice for the kids who are listening who want to be writers themselves? Now, we know that you weren't writing as a kid, uh, but maybe you have something that you learned as a 50 year old writer <laughs> that can help a 10 year old writer. Do you know, um, I. I told you before that I named my characters after Avi. And so I'll give you Avi's answer to that question because I, mm. I think it's exactly right. And he says, if you're going to be a writer, then you have to be a, a reader. 
you have to be a good reader before you're going to be a good writer. And so anyone who wants to write should be reading everything. The stuff that you love, uh, the genre that you love, if you love fantasy best of all, of course you got to be reading that. But if you're interested in being writing and doing writing, um, everything, everything should be your game. So if you want to think about word choice, you read poetry. If you want to think about dialogue, you read plays. Um, if you want to think about mm. really great, great descriptive writing, you can read nonfiction. But I, I, whatever it is, you only learn how to be a writer if you're already a reader. And I, you know, mm. I teach writing here at the college level. And I can tell pretty much within a paragraph if the person who is uh, handing me this piece, this story or whatever, has been a reader. I can always tell very, very quickly. You just know how to do it. Hmm. You know what the language can do. Because our language, I mean, English is an amazing language. It's, a bar it's borrowed from everywhere in the world. It's just hmm. so extraordinary what it can do. Um, hmm. you, if you only get that if you can see great writers doing it themselves. That's how you learn it. Hmm. So read That's everything. That's good advice. Read everything. Hmm. Well, Gary, thank you so much for, for joining us on Withy Wendell. Uh, this has been a great way to kick off season four. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Well, that was Gary Schmidt. Thanks so much to him for coming on the podcast and being our first interview subject on this fourth season. Next week, we'll be back with, uh, Alyssa, with Alyssa Coleman. Mm. Uh, we had a great time talking to her. She's a lot of fun. So you'll hear from her next week. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. And you know how the, the show ends, right? What's the, what's the last segment we do, Graham? Just want to see if you remember. Riddle time. Riddle time. I have a riddle for you. Um, we're going to give the riddle, but we're not going to give the answer because, of course, we give the answer next week. So are you ready for this riddle here on the, the first episode of season four? Let's hear it. Okay. So picture this. Mm -hmm. Graham. I'm in this? There is a building oh. with 100 floors. Yeah, okay. It's a skyscraper. Yep. A big skyscraper. So there's a short man who lives on the very top floor, which is the 100th floor. He's just not a very tall guy, right? Like, he just happens to not be very tall. It's just some people's... Lot short of. guy, tall building. Some people are tall, some people are short. Short guy lives in the top floor, right? Yep. He, uh, he I mean, he's less than five feet tall. He's a very, he's a very short man. And... He has to go up and down, right? Sometimes he has to go get groceries. He might have to go to the doctor. Maybe he has to go to work. You just go anywhere. Yeah, he might have to go, might want to go to the yeah. park, might want to walk his dog, although having a dog on the 100th floor of a, of a place sounds a little bit tricky. Yeah. Okay. I so bet he has a fish. On sunny days, this man rides the elevator up to the 70th floor. Okay. And he climbs the stairs up the rest of the way. What? Why? On rainy days, however. Okay, okay, okay. He rides the elevator straight to his apartment, the 100th floor. <laughs> Why? Why does he live this way? Why oh. does he travel from the ground floor to the 100th floor in this fashion? He, so he rides to, on sunny days, he rides the elevator up to the 70th floor, gets off, walks the rest of the ways. Yeah. On rainy days, he rides the elevator straight to his apartment. Why? That's this week's riddle. Wow. You're starting off season four uh, with some sort of... On a high note? Oh, just, oh, <laughs> 100 stories high. That's a thousand feet, isn't it? Is that a good joke, though? Joke? Would you rate that? How would you rate my high note joke out of 10? Low. Oh. But I'm bump. <laughs> uh, no, I was going to say, uh, you're starting off season four um, with, a, with a toughie. This sounds really tricky. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you a hint. You might think that he goes to the 70th floor and then gets off because he wants to get some exercise. That is not why. Oh, okay. There's a, or there's a reason. It has to do with the weather. Okay. So, okay. so that's the hint. That's the hint I'm going to give well, the kids. If you think you know the answer to uh, David's really tricky riddle, you will email us in at podcasts at goldberrybooks.com. At the end of the season, we are going to select... Uh, from all the right answers across all of the episodes um, and award a kid with books. Books. Well, what else We're would gonna it be? We're going to send you books. You think it's going to be gold coins or something or a golden goose? <laughs> Not golden goose, no golden pigeon, no golden book. 
Regular book. I own a bookstore, not a golden goose store. You own a storyporium. A storyporium. Or something of the sort. Exactly. That's right. A papyroporium. <laughs> Scrollopolis. <laughs> All of these are great. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you, as I said earlier, to Gary Schmidt for being the first guest here on season four. And thanks also to the publishers of the Tree Street Kids for sponsoring this episode of the show. Head over to treestreetkids.com to learn about Lions to the Rescue and Mystery in Crooked Creek Woods, the two new books. All right, Graham, that's it. Get out of my studio. I mean, this has been great. (laughs) 